Our next speaker is someone who could tell you firsthand about geoengineering. Her name is Kristen Megan, and it's taken her a lot of guts to come here and speak what she has to say. So give her a big hand. This presentation has been brought to you by Gigi Bowman for State Senate and Oath Keepers. All right, first off, I just want to, I know everyone else has said it, but I really appreciate everybody that has come out here today. It's not just showing up and supporting an event, it's actually listening to those of us who here are here to share a message. So as it was presented to you, I'm here to speak to you about geoengineering. First thing I want to ask you is, who doesn't believe it exists? Anybody here on the fence? Okay. Well, hopefully when you leave here today, you don't just believe it. You share the information that I'm going to share with you, and you get more people on board to stop this ethical crime, unethical crime. I want to show you a video clip because the first thing people ask me about geoengineering is, who are these people? Who are the people that are, you know, kind of pushing the button to get this thing going? One of them, his name is David Keith. And David Keith has been low in the radar for a while. But he has written a book about climate engineering that has basically done more for the truth movement of this than anything. Because he is the frontline person that is the number one advocate for geoengineering. And I want to show you a clip. It's about six minutes, so just bear with me. You ever look at those planes up there that have contrails on them? Maybe all those planes are the contrails. Maybe they're actually spraying chemicals into the atmosphere right now, and Uncle Sam isn't telling us. Seems extremely unlikely. The that fact the United that government... States is not telling something to its citizens, that seems extremely <laughs> likely to me. Uh, and, of course, there are a lot of problems with what they're proposing. It, it turns out plants need uh, sun, sunlight. Yes. Have you gotten some, some grief for suggesting this? Sure. I mean, this is like writing a book as the case for leprosy. Well, first of all, let me ask you this question, because there, there, there's a rumor, I don't know if this is true or not, that some scientists are trying to figure out a way to block the sun <laughs> to try to, to slow yeah. down global warming. Could an individual start this? In practice, only a country. A okay. big country. What about a man in like a hollowed out volcano? <laughs> with henchmen who occasionally shakes his fist at the sky and says, they said I was a fool at Harvard. Who's the fool now? It's all things considered from NPR West. I'm Arun Roth. If scientists get the calculations wrong, it could be catastrophic for life on Earth. Or what if the technology got into the wrong hands? Couldn't someone shoot poison into the atmosphere? So people are terrified about talking about this because uh -huh. they're scared that it will prevent us cutting emissions. Right, and also that it's sulfuric acid. <laughs> it is. You're bearing the lead. Is there any possible way this could come back to bite us in the ass? Uh, you know, you put a, another kind of pollution, sulfur dioxide, up to orbit the cover the atmosphere, the sky won't be really blue in the way it is now anymore. Blanketing the earth in sulfuric acid, because I'm all for it. This is the all chocolate dinner. I still get to have my CO2, and I just need to spray sulfuric acid. Right? All over the earth. Right? But we put 50 million tons of sulfuric acid in the air now as pollution, and it kills a million people a year worldwide. Okay, and that's and so good or bad? It's terrible. <laughs> but it'll be better if we put more in. So if pollution. it kills a million people, and it's we're only bad. doing about 1% more, we're just killing 10,000 more people. You can do math. So killing people is not the objective here. <laughs> killing people, not the objective. objective I just objective wanted to be clear. I just wanted to be clear. Because some very mainstream scientists are saying that the climate change situation is so bad that saving life as we know it might require something radical, like shooting chemicals into the stratosphere to reflect sunlight. This is the kind of stuff I wake up sweating about, exactly. Well, it's your goddamn idea. <laughs> No, it actually turns out to be an old idea. This really? was known since President Johnson, and the scientific community mostly decided not to talk about it. It, it, it. What happens to the sulfuric acid after it's sprayed? Does it just stay up there? No, it rains down. Okay. But, it, but as I said, <laughs> it rains down. Okay, okay. It's a tiny addition. Okay. And you put 
you'd put, say, 20,000 tons of sulfuric acid uh -huh. into the stratosphere every year, uh -huh. and each year you have to put a little more, mm -hmm. and this doesn't, in the long run, mean that you can forget about cutting emissions. We will need to rein in No, emissions. we'll get to it eventually. Yeah. But it does. But in the meantime, we're shrouding the earth in sulfuric acid. So it is that you could actually spray sulfuric acid in the stratosphere, 20 kilometers over our head, and use that to stop the planet warming up in a okay, kind wait, of ugly you, tech fix. You could, you could spray something into the atmosphere to yes. change, okay, spray okay. Spray pollution into the atmosphere to stop it warming. So in the end, pollution saves them all. <laughs> we owe pollution, we owe acid rain an apology is what you're saying. It would be a totally imperfect technical fix. Okay. It would have risks. It wouldn't get us out of the long run need to stop polluting, but it might actually save people and be useful sky won't be really blue in the way it is now anymore. The chemtrails are being used in conjunction with heart. By spraying metal oxides into the air above enemy skies, then directing ELF waves from HARP to heat those metal oxides, the temperature of the sky is raised to more than 100 degrees Fahrenheit, preventing the accumulation of water vapor that would otherwise form clouds and produce rainfall. So I wanted you to see that video because I wanted you to have a face for somebody who's actually out there violating the ethics of their job to promote geoengineering. I'm going to talk about geoengineering, but I want to share a story with you. Every time I'm asked to speak, I, I'm a, I public speak for a living, um, I'll go into that, but I don't get nervous to speak to you. What I get nervous about is not getting emotional telling you my story. Because in 2002, shortly after 9-11, like a lot of military veterans, I raised my right hand and I took an oath to the Constitution to hopefully do something meaningful with my life, you know, 19 years old, unsure what I wanted to do. So I enlisted in the U.S. Air Force. My job in the U.S. Air Force was working in bioenvironmental engineering. So what bioenvironmental engineering is in the Air Force is equivalent to that of the OSHA and the EPA, if you're familiar with that. So we were an embedded liaison to make sure that we were tracking all of the aspects and impacts of the military, meaning what is the military doing and how is it impacting the environment because we were accountable for that. Being government, we did not get any special treatment. We just couldn't be fined being another federal agency. EPA can't, but not OSHA. So from the health side, it was knowing what you do in the Air Force. What does your job entail that is hazardous to your health? And I'm gonna give you an example. Let's say that you were an aircraft painter, you were a mechanic. My job would go out to make sure I knew everything that you did, what you were exposed to, and how to mitigate and engineer out those hazards. Because we needed to, one, it, it's your legal right to be working in a safe and healthful work environment. So throughout nine years, I worked as an industrial hygienist and an environmental specialist. One of, actually, there's two bases I was at that are called air logistics centers. What does that mean? It's not like a fighter wing, you know, it's not really fun and amazing. What they did is they took aircraft that around every 10 to 15 years, they were required to be dismantled down to the last screw. So that meant every single industrial process you can think about, checking the metal integrity, making sure everything's good to go or sometimes overhauling equipment. Part of my job in tracking the health hazards was to look at any time someone wanted to buy a chemical, any type of chemical. It was ordered through a system, and in that system, I had to go in there and say, you know, the country we're in, we're not allowed to use this. We need to substitute it out with something a little less hazardous, while also maintaining the integrity for a technical order, meaning for that process it says you must use you know, xylene or toluene to do this process. Well, I have to kind of fast forward. I want to say around 2006, I started kind of opening my eyes to how the military wasn't really what I thought it was. And people approached me knowing what I did for a living and said, have you ever heard of chemtrails? Well, I hadn't. And that sparked my interest. So I went online and I looked at chemtrails. I saw a lot of, you know, debunking, a lot of sites that were just kind of calling it a conspiracy theory. And I thought, well, geez, this is what I do for a living. Preventive health, making sure that people are not getting sick, especially in the workplace, and by things that we're doing that can affect, you know, human health and the environment. 
to summarize it, in an attempt to debunk this conspiracy theory as I thought it was, I didn't debunk it. It literally changed my life. Um, like I said, this is hard for me because it's not easy standing here and telling my story. One day I was going through that computer system, which if you want to look it up, it's called an Air Force Form 3952. It is the approval of ha hazardous materials. I was finding tons and tons of large quantities of aluminum, barium, strontium in the forms of oxides and sulfates. And of course I knew that there's industrial processes you may not have heard of, but it's bead blasting, pneumatic sanding, shot peening. There is certain medias that's similar to that that is used. However, I had already accounted for that. I would sit and look at this computer system and say, this shop wants to order this paint. I'm going to tie it to a task. We had to know what was being used, why it was being used, tracking it cradle to grave on how we were going to dispose of it to be compliant with OSHA and the EPA. One of the legal requirements in approving these is looking at what used to be called the material safety data sheet. On that sheet, it's going to list the manufacturer. It's going to list some maybe acquired personal protective equipment that needs to be used or some ways to mitigate the exposures. These electronic MSDSs did not have a manufacturer name. They were very vague. They almost looked to me like somebody had made it and scanned it into the system. So I asked the question, what is this being used for? I never got an answer, so I didn't approve it. And it sat there. And then the heat came down. Why aren't you? Are you behind on your 3952s? Only a select few of us did that. So I started asking questions. And at that point, my demonization began. You know, I, I made my rank. I was decorated. I was a non-commissioned officer of the quarter. I won lots of awards. I had no reason for anyone to attempt to demonize me. So then I get moved over to the other Air Logistics Center. There's only two in the Air Force, which is in Warner Robins, Georgia. This kind of carried with me. And I thought, you know what? Should I revisit this? Is it worth it? Did I hit something? Maybe it's need to know. I started finding the same things at Robbins Air Force Base. I was now doing some more investigation work. Part of what I did was to use a high volume air sampler to air sample um, up to, I'd say, a football field in about 10 minutes. I also conducted soil sampling. Because I thought, you know, if, if this is real and they are spraying this, it's going to get to the ground. So I conducted air sampling. I conducted soil sampling. And I was getting high levels of these contaminants. When I started asking the question again under a new commander, I never in my life thought I would have somebody look me in the face and tell me, I am questioning you. Is there something wrong with you? You've been looking really depressed lately. You know I can put you under a mental evaluation for a, up to 120 days. Who would take care of your daughter? Because I was divorced at the time. As soon as I heard that, I knew. It validated everything I ever thought. And I thought, I have spent nine years of my life trying to protect human health, and here we are violating law after law after law. Just sitting here, instead of protecting the people, we are poisoning the people. And I've never got up so much courage from that fear of being thrown in a cage, because when you're in the military, folks, you're a number. You are a number, and every aspect of your life is controlled. I was so lucky that my enlistment was coming up and I was supposed to re-enlist. I ran and did not look back, and I have been blowing the whistle and shouting ever since. And I left October 27, 2010. Thank you. It didn't just end there, though. You got to remember, there's a whole career field of people that work in bioenvironmental engineering. A lot of those people were told, do not talk to me. Do not talk to her. Do not email her. They were given no contact orders. Because my biggest thing was, if I'm just so you know, dishonest, don't you think somebody would come out and say you know, she was never in the military or something negative to discredit me? They've ignored me, but they've tried to silence me. 
every time I fly, I am pulled into a secret room. I, I literally am tagged in the system for the TSA. It is difficult. As an industrial hygienist, I do very well for myself, but it has been so difficult after leaving the federal government to maintain employment. Nowadays, everyone runs background checks on you, and the first thing they look at is, wow, here's a whistleblower. And you ask yourself, if this is true and we are spraying the people, where are the pilots? Where are the people? I don't know if you pay attention, but look at Snowden. Look at, look at Manning. People don't come forward because these supposed Whistleblower Act protections that you have are not enforced, they're not supported, and they really don't exist. But what I want you to take from this is to understand that I am being completely honest with you and that geoengineering is occurring, it's been occurring, it is not new, and your tax dollars are funding this. I 100% know that the U.S. Air Force was involved, and it kind of, I think back to all these things that I never had noticed. You don't, if you don't know what to look for, you can't look for something. And once I realized a process they were trying to hide, people have come out of the woodworks, from EPA compliance officers to ex-people that I worked with in my career field, who I cannot state for obvious reasons. I've had pilots come forward. I've had people come forward that actually load the canisters on the planes. These people don't come forward because they are afraid that they're going to end up like Snowden. And I continue to speak to let people know I've been screaming about this for three years and I'm still here. And why are you so afraid? Because many of these people are on active duty. And if you are willing to die for your country, supporting you know, the Constitution and defending us from enemies foreign and domestic, you were willing to die for your country, but now you're scared. You are scared and cowardly to talk about this. So I'm not just speaking to all of you in this room, I'm speaking to all those people that are gonna watch this online and watch it on YouTube. Because you can come forward, you can help expose this, and we can stop it. So many people wanna ask, why? Why is this occurring? That's for later thought. From weather modification to weather weaponry, there, there's numerous reasons under Agenda 21 and tons of theories. But my job as an industrial hygienist is to make sure that I comply with the laws and enforce them. So it is unethical every day for all the other people that are out there that work in preventive health or even physicians that aren't speaking about this, they need to. So one thing I want to tell you is what you can do about it. The biggest hurdle that we have is disinformation sites. I never say them, but I'm going to today so that you know if anyone ever gives these to you as a reference to debunk you, it's Metabunk and Contrail Science. Those are two websites that are ran by a government shill named Mick West. And he is a computer gaming programmer who tries to tell you about persistent contrails. So somebody who isn't even credentialed in chemistry or physics or ecology, none of that, is trying to tell you that you're crazy. Okay? So also on social media, don't just hit the share button. There are links. You have to understand that I have met people who used to be purposeful disinformation trolls, as we call them. These people are paid to pretend that they're you, to get you on board to believe a website or an article just so that you look so vulnerable. And then later it will be deemed non-credible and then you look non-credible. So please vet research. And if you have something to write with, I want you to take down my email. It is Kristen, K-R-I-S-T-E-N, Megan, M-E-G-H-A-N, at gmail.com. And by emailing me, I can give you some information for what I'm about to tell you. If you still don't believe it, or you still want to convince people, there's something you can do. You can take a glass jar. It needs to be a glass jar, so there's no BPAs. Take a rain sample, and take a snow sample. I tried to disencourage the soil sampling because everyone's background of where you live is different. Because a lot of the materials that are used in geoengineering are natural occurring in Earth, just not in the industrialized form that they are used. So if you take these rain samples and you take the snow samples, email me because I cannot publicly tell you where to send them because we've actually been blackballed by labs who refuse to run our samples. And a problem that is occurring is people are sending in rain samples 
to labs that don't realize how low the limit of detection needs to be because these are nanoparticulates. They are very small. So if you email me, I can tell you where to send in your samples, and it's only around $50. That may be tough on some people, but it's way cheaper than maybe what you assumed. So I just want everyone to know and understand that of all things, of all the freedoms that we are losing, geoengineering is the number one issue that we are facing because you can have guns and money and you can have everything. If you don't have food and water and you are dying of respiratory or neurological illnesses, what does it matter? So you've heard about vaccines and you'll hear you know, about smart meters and you'll hear about other issues like fracking. These are all systemic effects. We are getting overexposed to toxins. People will tell you fluoride's in the water, but it's not a lot. It is a lot because you're getting it everywhere in your food, you know, water that you drink. Everything is, excuse me, is washed with that water. And you're getting your vaccines. All this, it's a coupled systemic effect and our bodies cannot metabolize these toxins. So I just want to thank you for taking the time to listen to my story. And I will continue to shout from the rooftops. I don't care how many jobs I lose. I don't care how many friends or family I lose because I took an oath. And in nine years, I was not able to honor that oath, but I am today. <laughs>